takes you back, uh, I think the number is like 90% of the age of the universe. So here's that phenomenon. Here's a, here's a graph showing that phenomenon. Uh, you know, what you find, so we're plotting the flux that's observed from one of these guys versus the distance. And what's the first thing you learn as amateur astronomers? You learn that the reason that the stars are so faint is that they're very, very far away. You also learn things like the brightest stars that we see in the sky, um, you know, are not necessarily the, the closest because maybe they're, because they're very, very much more luminous. So you look at something, you see how apparently bright it is. You have to take into account how, how luminous it is and how far away it is. And you know that basically, generally, as things get farther and farther away, they get fainter. So that's what's going on over here. But then, at some point, we begin to see this brighter emission because of the redshift. So because the redshift is shifting the brightest emission from the galaxy into our wave band, all of a sudden, um, the, uh, uh, at about a redshift of one, uh, the, uh, the, the, the plot flattens out, which means that if I can reach a particular sensitivity limit here, I can see everything. And here is the LMT sensitivity in one second. So I'll be able to see things like this famous uh, nearby uh, 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 star-forming galaxy, R220, out through the whole history of the universe. And just to give you a sense of what we could do with that, here's that original picture that was made of the Hubble Deep Field. Uh, again, I, it took a month to do this. Uh, it was a total of 50 hours integration time. Uh, they reached a particular sensitivity level of 0.6 milligansies, which I don't think will mean very much in most of us. But, um, so this is the area that can be covered. With our Aztec instrument on LNT as it is supposed to perform, um, if we spend the same 50 hours, we're going to go a factor of 30 deeper in sensitivity we'll be able to cover uh, a few times the area, and we should detect 600 sources. Okay. Uh, so another way to put it, uh, 600 sources that have never been seen before. So another way to put it is that if you take this instrument and our new telescope and you point it anywhere on the sky and integrate that long, you'll discover a new object. <coughs> That's a, that's a pretty powerful telescope. So, uh, <laughs> in fact, I once, uh, I, I'm sorry for the anecdotes, because I did a good one. But I, I, I once had the opportunity to go and meet with um, the, uh, the Mexican Senate Science Committee. So I sat there at lunch with some senators. And one of them said, well, how, you know, how, how powerful will this telescope be? So I said, well, sir, we'll be able to point this thing anywhere in the sky and uh, integrate one second, and we'll be able to detect a new object, discover a new object. And he said, whoa, that's very powerful. So I think you know, that's quite a, quite a thing. The comparison. <laughs> We can be operating all, uh, all day and night, 24 hours a day? We, cannot, we nominally can operate 24 hours a day. Initially, I think we'll primarily <laughs> operate at night because the thermal conditions are better and it's easier to keep everything lined up than when you've got the sun beating down on it. But we can operate day and night. Um, just to show you how we measure up um, against the billion dollar instrument, um, uh, you know, uh, it would take them, according to their own website, 100 hours to do the same experiment. So at least we're in the same ballgame. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, astronomers are pretty tricky with these comparisons, so you always have to be a little bit skeptical. But, uh, now the, the good thing is that not only can we discover these things, but if we use this other receiver that we built, the redshift receiver, then we can uh, point it and uh, learn and uh, measure the redshift of objects. So here's a model uh, spectrum. Uh, showing a, a simulation based upon uh, um, you know, some nearby objects um, uh, and the molecular lines we should be able to see in something like a one hour integration. So we'll be able to take these things that we discover and follow them up, measure the redshift, and now you know how far away it is and you can begin to do astrophysics because now you know where it is, how far away it is, you can interpret what you're seeing, um, and uh, you, know, you can begin to talk about even chemical composition. And we know that now these things have been observed out to redshift six with uh, molecular level. So we, we have a, a good, good inkling. This is all really rather new stuff. I mean, you know, apparently there were, you know, what we call in astronomy metals, uh, things like carbon and oxygen to make carbon monoxide 
um, uh, very early in the history of uh, the universe and the galaxy. So we really have the sensitivity to do the, the follow-up that's needed to do it. Um, the other instrument, the so-called speed instrument, we didn't talk very much about, is another way of getting in a relatively short time a constraint on what the ratio is. Uh, just uh, basically, speed measures four different uh, frequency channels, and by by uh, basically seeing what the, the slope of the spectrum is at that particular those particular sets of frequencies and combining it with other data, you can get a pretty good estimate of the ratio. Uh, so. This thing is going to be a very powerful thing. Um, we put together, uh, uh, using this full complement of instruments, actually we renamed this thing Volocam 2, that's Aztec. Um, uh, uh, we'd be able to do the, the initial discovery and all of the follow-up work that's needed uh, in order to uh, learn about this population of objects, at which at this point there is something like only 100 of these things now. So, um, in talking about this uh, project to people, why does it make sense to do it? Um, uh, for the point of view of astronomical research, we're going to have a world-class scientific facility, and it's going to be complementary to the major international uh, initiative of millimeter astronomy, uh, ALMA, so it makes great sense from the point of view of research. For uh, instrumentation, particularly for our group that builds instruments, it's going to be a fabulous uh, platform for new instruments. Um, gives us something to work on. And uh, also, these single dishes um, are a great platform for anybody that's got an instrument to build something and bring it in. It, it really puts you know, front rank research into the realm of uh, you know, the tabletop uh, experimentalists in a small laboratory. They can build an instrument, bring it to the big collecting area, and discover something new. And uh, I'll just brag about it. I mean, we're, we're particularly uh, 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 sensitive to that because one of the things that was done at UMass in the early days of the radio astronomy effort there was we would build instruments. I wasn't there at the time. We, we, the, the group would build uh, instruments, special purpose instruments, and take them to big telescopes and use them on the big telescopes to discover things. So in fact, our group was the first group other than the original group in Cambridge to find a pulsar because they read the paper and they went into the lab and they built a special receiver and went out and found the next pulsar that uh, was being found. And um, our group built special, uh, the UMass group uh, uh, built special receivers in the laboratory and took them to the big radio telescope in Puerto Rico, Arecibo, and did surveys and they uh, uh, they discovered something that's called a binary pulsar. Uh, professor then at UMass, Joe Taylor, and his graduate student, Russell Hulse, discovered this. Hulse's thesis was about the binary pulsar, and Taylor and Hulse won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1993. So um, uh, we know that these kinds of opportunities are really important, uh, and uh, uh, the MIT is going to be able to provide, I hope, some of those kinds of opportunities. In fact, uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry with the answer. But I, I went. Um, I uh, was in a meeting one time with the director of the equivalent of the National Science Foundation in Mexico, and we were explaining about the project. And he said something like, "Well, you know, of course, we expect that this telescope is going to result in a Nobel Prize." And I said, "Well, you know, our group has some experience with this." <laughs> um, the, uh, and then, of course, the other reason that we at the university are uh, interested in this is because it provides great scientific opportunities for our students, but it also provides uh, important uh, opportunities for, for training uh, students uh, in the kinds of techniques and the technical work that's uh, necessary to build instruments and operate telescopes. And it turns out that, uh, sadly, today, telescopes have gotten so complicated that sometimes it's very hard for the students to get in and actually get their hands dirty and do it. Once things, you know, once you're talking about your billion-dollar space telescope, I mean, you know, there's no way that students are going to go up there and start to be able.